Okay, before we continue to go on, I wanted to just do a general discussion of Scott's Pine. There's been a lot of questions about fertilization. Uh, so as a group, let's discuss these things, okay? So if you were in the workshop, this is gonna be a bit redundant, but let's talk about the training of Scott's Pine. I guess, do you guys call it Scott's Pine or do you call it Sylvester's? Scott's Pine, okay, all right, cool. Sylvester's. I've had people say it's not a Scott's Pine, it's a Sylvester's. Okay, all right, Scott's Pine. So we've got two major differences in terms of the way that we handle the growth and the training of Scott's Pine. We've got the stage of development or the stage of creation known as refinement, and then we've got the stage known as development. Okay. Believe it or not, we are striving for a point in this tree's life where we're no longer developing, right? Where we are, in fact, refining. So when we're refining, our technique of choice is pinching. Pinching, okay? Pinching to reallocate strength and energy towards the interior root or bud. So when we say refinement, if we go back to the vortex, right? We're talking about post third working in this area here, right? Where we've already established our structure, our secondary, and our tertiary. So we're saying we have our primary structure, our secondary, and our tertiary branching intact in order to be doing the refinement process. Now, we have a silhouette that we're striving to achieve, this nice, beautiful fan-shaped pad with some vertical contour, okay? But we realize that at any one time, we have several shoots that aren't actually contributing to that exterior silhouette. Now, in the springtime, we'll have some shoots that are right up at the edge of that silhouette, and we're quite happy with their position, okay? All of these shoots are going to be candling. All right? Now, when we're doing the refinement process for a Scotch pine, we're going to be fertilizing heavily in the spring. Now, a lot of us might say, oh, we fertilize, then we get longer needles. Well, if we're to this point, where we've already got our structure, secondary, and tertiary set up, fertilization, because we have an abundance of needles and an abundance of shoots, should not excessively add to the needle length of a Scotch pine. For example, if we fertilize this thing very heavily because of the abundance of needles on the tree, I would not expect those needles to get this long. Now, if we, had a, if we had this same tree and only one of these branches on it and we fertilized, you could expect the tree to produce excessively long needles, okay? Because the tree has X amount of surface area that it needs to provide the photosynthetic surface area to generate the energy to feed itself, okay? But the more needles we have, the less each of those needles needs to produce. Does that make sense? Okay, so when we're here, where we've already got our structure, our secondary, and our tertiary, we're fertilizing to push energy into this new growth, and we're assuming that because Scott's Pine has a short needle naturally, we're not going to be adversely impacting the needle size. So we're going to say fertilizing spring through fall. Okay, now this is different than, say, a mugo pine. A mugo pine having the potential to produce very large needles. Right? On a mugo pine, once we get to this refinement process, we may not be fertilizing in the spring anymore. We might be holding off on spring fertilization so that we don't get excessively long needles. All right? So this is specific to the scotch. Now, when we have these candles protrude outside of our silhouette, we're going to be pinching these off to maintain, maintain the shape of our silhouette. We always need to be leaving at least, at least two pairs of needles where we pinch. We never want to fully remove this, this candle, okay? Now, if we do on a Scots pine, we know Scots pine is so vigorous, it'll just produce new buds somewhere, but you've lost the benefit of that new year of growth, okay? You want to continue to have even distribution of new growth across these branches, right? So we're always leaving some portion of this new bud, and we're pinching while this is still an elongated cylinder before we ever start to see this produce needle buds or elongating needles. If we wait that long, it's too late. We'll pinch and we have the potential to remove the whole bud at that time, okay? We want to be pinching when it's still elongating as a single cylinder. That's when it's still soft 
that's prior to the vascular structure establishing itself so that it doesn't readily break in half. Okay? Always leaving. Now, what happens when we do this, right? When we pinch this, all of a sudden, the hormone that's in the tip of this, called oxen, okay? Oxen naturally suppresses the growth of buds behind that uh, growing tip, okay? This is what allows trees to grow tall. So any apically dominant tree, vine, uh, spruce, right? They will have a tremendous amount of oxen. When you remove that oxen, what happens is the strength that was moving into this and this suppression are both gone, and that is transferred now into the smaller shoots or the smaller branches behind that. So we can get another stage of elongation if we're fertilizing and allow these tertiary branches to gain strength and continue to contribute to the exterior silhouette. So as these grow, we pinch. That removal of oxen allows this bud to grow. We can pinch, and if we're really good, we start getting really fine ramification. We can get up to three elongations of a candle in one single spring season, okay? This is very similar in terms of how we would handle the Zuisha white pine as well. In Japan, we did this every year. Rapid development of foliage pads through aggressive fertilization, pinching of the elongating candles, redirecting energy, removing suppression, and allowing the secondary, tertiary, and even finer branches to produce candles that contribute to this exterior silhouette. Does that make sense? Okay. When we're in development, we're saying, listen, our, our technique of choice now is pruning. Pruning. So we're saying we're in development when we've only got our structure or our secondary branching and we're looking to generate either secondary branching or tertiary branching, okay? So first and foremost, we've got to understand the nature of generating back buds because it's a common misconception to think that when we prune, we get back buds. That's not true, right? In order to get back budding, we need to increase traffic moving along this branch. We need to increase resources, okay? So our first stage of development is allowing these candles to accumulate foliage mass. Okay? Just by adding needle count, right? You're losing more water out of the needle, which is forcing the roots to supply more nutrition and moisture to that branch. You're photosynthesizing more. Because you've got more needles accumulating the sun's energy and turning that into food, which means you're sending that food back down to the roots, okay? That traffic, that increase of movement through that branch is what stimulates backbudding, all right? We want to produce backbudding before we ever go back and prune. Because if we prune to stimulate backbudding, we've effectively eliminated that surface area that generates that backbud, okay? So we're going to use this to set up potential buds, all right? And we see this with Yamadori trees when we collect them coming out of the wild, they're extremely sparse, they've got branching just at the tips. After we cultivate them for two years in a container, fertilize aggressively, rebuild the root system, we typically tend to see them back bud regardless of what we do, okay? If we continue to expand on that, increase that traffic, right? Once we get the presence of these back buds the following year, as this elongates, we allow those needles to elongate, and harden off. And once they've hardened off, we go back in and we remove that oxinal suppression. Always leaving at least two pairs of needles below where we prune, right? But eliminating that apical tip, which then allows these buds that have probably started to form to actually candle and start contributing. Once we get these into active foliage development, we now move to the refinement process to start forming our canopy and our silhouette. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's a big difference. I think a lot of times we make the mis, uh, have the misconception with Scott's pine, we allow them to grow, we allow them to needle out, and then we come back and we fully remove that candle, right? The candle of Scott's pine. Well, Scott's pine is not a black pine, it's not a Japanese red pine. It's not a, a pine that's going to produce two flushes of mature growth in one season, right? It's a single flush pine, it only produces one flush of growth per season. You have to preserve some of that growth on every shoot. Whether that means you pinch and only leave a little bit of it because you're refining that branch pad, 
or whether that means you allow it to elongate, the needles harden off, and you go back in and prune. Okay? That depends on the stage of growth that the tree is in. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's talk about fertilization. Fertilization is a big question. A lot of times people say, what do you fertilize with? Right? What do you fertilize with? That's a really significant question. But I guess I should ask the question before we say, what do you fertilize with? Why are you fertilizing? Okay, or maybe the more important question, what are we trying to accomplish? What's the goal, right? What is the goal? At every single stage of that tree's development, your goal for fertilization should be shifting, right? We never have one single goal. We fertilize why? We fertilize to produce growth. No, that's not good enough. That's not good enough to create a refined bone site. That's not good enough to pursue bone site at the highest level. We've got to go another level deeper, right? Why are we fertilizing? We're fertilizing to be able to increase strength in the candles so we can redistribute that strength and boost the strength of our tertiary buds, right? Okay, we're fertilizing to increase the strength so we get elongation, expand the photosynthetic surface area, we generate resources that will promote back budding, right? Those two different methods require two different uh, fertilizers based on what we're trying to accomplish, okay? So say, for example, we're on the refinement phase. When we said we're fertilizing, <coughs> spring through fall, and we're trying to get those candles to push out, we're going to pinch and we're going to redistribute energy into our weaker branches. We may be looking at consistent, moderate application of pelletized organic feed, okay? Consistency is all we're looking for, right? <laughs> Maybe that means that on a container this large, we apply four locations where our fertilizer right, is applied, and maybe in this location, say we're using BioGold or, or uh, um, Green King or, or some other pelletized form, maybe we have six to eight pellets per pile, all right? Even distribution, even distribution between the trunk and the edge of the container, even distribution around the container, okay? This is for refinement. Now say, for example, we have the exact same tree in the exact same container and we're in the development phase. Okay, we're trying to produce growth that not necessarily is going to contribute to a refined bone size. We're trying to produce growth that is increasing the vigor of our tree, that is capable of generating back budding by adding, adding energy to the tree, right? This growth that we encourage in development is not refinable growth. This is robust, vigorous growth, okay? So maybe we're saying, listen, we're gonna have 10 to 12 pellets per pile, and maybe instead we have five, six, seven, eight piles, as opposed to three or four, okay? So that difference is significant. And maybe we say in development, on top of the application, of our pelletized fertilizer, we're also supplementing with a foliar feed of fish emulsion, right? Or of kelp, or something that can further enhance hormonal activity in that tree with the addition of that nutrition, okay? But if we were refining our tree, and we did that same application of robust fertilization in excessive quantities, or we added fish emulsion or kelp or some other component, we may get growth that's no longer manageable, that's no longer refinable. Does that make sense? Okay, so what are we trying to accomplish should be the first question that you ask yourself when we start talking about fertilization. What stage of development is this tree in? Because it's not just let's produce growth, let's produce growth, let's produce growth. No, let's produce the type of growth that we want for this stage of this tree's development. All right, last thing, pelletized organic feed. Why is this important? when we talk about fertilization. Can you get robust, vigorous growth with chemical feed? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But is it just the nutrition that forms this, the, the pivotal 
uh, portion or the most important aspect of fertilization? Is it just the nutrition? No? What else does fertilization help contribute to? Root growth. Yeah, root growth. Okay. But you can get that with chemical as well as organic, can you not? For a pro prolonged period. So it's, it's, it's a small amount regular. Small amount regularly with the organics? Yeah. Rather than just okay. Okay. Well, rather than just this major injection. Okay. To be sure. organic or non-organic? Non-organic fertilizers. Residue, something left behind in chemicals, maybe. Sure. Build up, maybe, maybe. So this is a this is a concept that's been in uh, in evolution for quite some time in terms of justifying organic fertilizer. What is what is the justification of organic fertilizer versus chemical? Because chemical is quite easy, right? And it delivers the nutrition in an immediately available form. And the plant gets it and it grows. Okay. But when we're cultivating bonsai, we're cultivating a tree in a confined environment, right? Cultivating a tree in a confined environment comes along with a significant number of challenges. It can never be as vigorous as a tree being grown in the ground or a tree being grown in an expansive environment. Now you've got a tree whose vigor is reduced, right? The sheer concept, right, of growing bonsai is to say cultivating a tree in a confined environment to reduce the rate and proportion at which it grows. That means you're making that tree less vigorous. Less vigorous means more susceptible. More susceptible to what? Heat, cold, drought. Insects and disease. Okay, so how do you combat that with the bonsai tree or in bonsai culture? How do you combat that reduced vigor? Make sure the tree is healthy. Make sure the tree is healthy, right? Make sure the tree has an immune system capable of giving it every opportunity to th uh, thrive and survive. Where does the tree's immune system originate? In the roots. In the roots. Okay, so we've got to feed the tree's ability to resist, all right? Now, <coughs> when you talk about the way that tree's root systems function, when a tree is healthy, it excretes fluids, much like an aphid does on the foliage mass as it feeds. Aphids secrete honeydew, and on that honeydew, black sooty mold grows, right? Have we all seen that before? Yes, we regrettably say yes, right? It, a tree's roots are no different. A tree's roots excretes a fluid on which flora inside the container grows, okay? Now this flora, the most common one that we would come to identify, mycorrhiza, right? Mycorrhiza expands the surface area for moisture and nutritional uptake, particularly when we start talking about pines, Scots pines, mugo pines, they absolutely have to have beneficial bacteria growing in the container in order for them to expand their mo moisture and nutritional uptake, okay? So we're saying, listen, if a tree is healthy, it's actually feeding the development of this flora. But the tree alone is not enough, right? We've got to provide organic material upon which that bacteria can work and feed and contribute to the breakdown process to continue to expand and grow. If we're providing nutrition in an immediately available form for a plant to take in, there's no need for beneficial bacteria or microorganisms to be present in the container. And so they disappear, right? So when we take that and we transition that into a bonsai container where we have a confined environment, feeding and facilitating microbiotic activity is one of the biggest ways we can increase a plant's resistance to all of the factors that impact health in a bonsai container and a bonsai culture, all right? And that's why it's important to pursue organic feed in a pelletized form. Did I sell you on it? Yeah? If only I had a fertilizer now to say, buy this now. <laughs> okay. Any, any questions on the development of Scott's Pine on fertilization? No? No, we're good? Okay, all right.